This is section four of Mark Twain by Archibald Henderson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Humorist, Part One, recorded by John Greenman. Exhilaration can be infinite, like sorrow. A joke can be so big that it breaks the roof of the stars. By simply going on being absurd, a thing can become godlike. There is but one step from the ridiculous to the sublime. Gilbert K. Chesterton, quoting Charles Dickens. Not without wide significance in its bearing upon the general outlines of contemporary literature is the circumstance that Mark Twain served his apprenticeship to letters in the high school of journalism. Like his contemporaries, Artemus Ward and Bret Hart, he first found free play for his comic intransigence in the broad freedom of the journal for the masses. Brilliant as he was, Artemus Ward seemed most effective only when he spoke in weird vernacular through the grotesque mouthpiece of his own invention. Bret Hart sacrificed more and more of the native flavor of his genius in his progressive preoccupation with the more sophisticated refinements of the purely literary. Mark Twain never lost the ruddy glow of his first inspiration, and his style, to the very end, remained as it began, journalistic, untamed, primitive. Both Rudyard Kipling and Bernard Shaw, who, like Mark Twain, have achieved comprehensive international reputations, have succeeded in preserving the early vigor and telling directness acquired in journalistic apprenticeship. It was by the crude, almost barbaric cry of his journalese that Rudyard Kipling awoke the world with a start. That trenchant and forthright style, which imparts such an air of heightened verisimilitude to his plays, Bernard Shaw acquired in the ranks of the new journalism. The writer who aims at producing the platitudes which are not for an age but for all time says bernard shaw has his reward in being unreadable in all ages whilst plato and aristophanes trying to knock some sense into the athens of their day shakespeare peopling that same athens with elizabethan mechanics and warwickshire hunts ibsen photographing the local doctors and vestrymen of a norwegian parish Carpaccio painting the life of St. Ursula, exactly as if she were a lady living in the next street to him, are still alive, and at home everywhere among the dust and ashes of many thousands of academic, punctilious, most archaeologically correct men of letters and art, who spent their lives haughtily avoiding the journalist's vulgar obsession with the ephemeral. Mark Twain began his career by studying the people and period he knew in relation to his own life. Jamestown, Hannibal, and Virginia City, the stately Mississippi, and the orgiastic, uproarious life of western prairie, mountain, and gulch, start to life and live again in the pages of his books. Colonel Sellers, in the main, correct, but stretched a little here and there tom sawyer the magerful hero of boyhood the shrewd and kindly aunt polly drawn from his own mother huck finn with the tender conscience and the gentle heart these and many another were drawn from the very life in writing of his time apropos of himself mark twain succeeded in telling the truth about humanity in general and for any time in the main, though there are noteworthy exceptions, Mark Twain's works originated fundamentally in the facts of his own life. He is a master humorist, which is only another way of saying that he is a master psychologist with the added gift of humor, because he looked upon himself always as a complete and well-rounded repository of universally human characteristics. Humanus sum et nil humanum mihi alienum est. This might well have served for his motto. It was his conviction that the American possessed no unique and peculiar human characteristics, differentiating him from the rest of the world, 
in the same way he regarded himself as possessing no unique or peculiar human characteristics differentiating him from the rest of the human race like omar he might have said i myself am heaven and hell for within himself he recognized in some form at higher or lower power every feature trait instinct characteristic of which a human being is capable the last half-century of his life as he himself said in his autobiography had been constantly and faithfully devoted to the study of the human race his knowledge came from minute self-examination for he regarded himself as the entire human race compacted together it was by concentrating his attention upon himself by recognizing in himself the quintessential type of the race that he succeeded in producing works of such pure naturalness and utter verity a humor which is at bottom good humor is always contagious but there is a deeper and more universal appeal which springs from genial and unaffected representation of the human species of the universal genus homo it has been said by foreign critics that the intellectual life of america in general takes its cue from the day whilst the intellectual life of europe derives from history if american literature be really journalism under exceptionally favorable conditions as defined by the danish critic johannes v jensen then must mark twain be a typical product of american literature a certain modicum of truth may rest in this startling and seemingly uncomplimentary definition interpreted liberally it may be taken to mean that america finds her key to the future in the immediate vital present rather than in a remote and hazy past mark twain was a great creative genius because he saw himself and so saw human nature in the strong searching light of the living present he is the greatest genius evolved by natural selection out of the ranks of american journalism crude rudimentary and boisterous as his early writing was at times provincial and coarse it bore upon its face the fresh stamp of contemporary actuality to the american of to-day it is not a little exasperating to be placidly assured by our british critics that america is sublimely unconscious that her childhood is gone and this gay paradox is less arresting than the asseveration that america is lacking in humor because she is lacking in self-knowledge there is a certain grimly comic irony in this commiseration with us on the part of our british critics for our failure joyously to realize our old age which they would have us believe is a sort of premature senescence and decay the new world is pitied for her failure to know without illusion the futility of the hurried pursuit of wealth of the passion for extravagant opulence and inordinate display of all the hostages youth in america eternally gives to old age america has produced great artists admits mr gilbert chesterton yet he maintains that that fact most certainly proves that she is full of a fine futility and the end of all things whatever the american men of genius are they are not young gods making a young world is the art of whistler a brave barbaric art happy and headlong does mr henry james infect us with the spirit of a schoolboy out of america has come a sweet and startling cry as unmistakable as the cry of a dying man this sweet and startling cry is less startling than the obvious reflection that mr chesterton has chosen to illustrate his ludicrous paradox the two american geniuses who have lived outside their own country absorbed the art ideals of the older more sophisticated civilizations and lost touch with the youthful spirit the still almost barbaric violence the ongoing rush and progress of america 
It is worthy of remark that Mr. James has always maintained that Mark Twain was capable of amusing only very primitive persons, and Whistler, with his acid diablerie, was wholly alien in spirit to the boisterous humor of Mark Twain. That other brilliant but incoherent interpreter of American life, Mr. Charles Wibley, bound to the presupposed paradox of America's pathetic senescence and total deficiency in humor, blithely gives away his case in the vehement assertion that America's greatest national interpreter is Mark Twain. To the general, Mark Twain is, first and foremost and exclusively, the humorist. With his shrieking philistinism, his dominant sense for the colossally incongruous, his spontaneous faculty for staggering, ludicrous contrast. To the reflective, Mark Twain subsumed within himself a certain surcharge and overplus of power, a buoyancy, and a sense of conquest, which typified the youth of America. It is memorable that he breathed in his youth the bracing air of the prairie, shared the collective ardor of the Argonauts, felt the rising thrill of Western adventure, and expressed the crude and manly energy of navigation, exploration, and the daring hazard for new fortune. To those who knew him in personal intimacy, the quality that was outstanding, omnipresent, and eternally ineradicable from his nature was, paradoxical as it may sound, not humor, not wit, not irony, not a thousand other terms that might be associated with his name, but the spirit of eternal youth. It is comprehensively significant and conclusive that, to the day of her death, Mrs. Clemens never called her husband anything but the bright nickname Youth. Mark Twain is great as humorist, admirable as teller of tales, pungent as stylist, but he has achieved another sort of eminence that is peculiarly gratifying to Americans. They distinguish in his writings, says an acute French critic, exalted and sublimated by his genius, their national qualities of youth and of gaiety, of force and of faith. They love his philosophy, at once practical and high-minded. They are fond of his simple style, animated with verve and spice, thanks to which his work is accessible to every class of readers. They think he describes his contemporaries with such an art of distinguishing their essential traits that he manages to evoke, to create even, characters and types of eternal verity. They profess for Mark Twain the same sort of vehement admiration that they have in France for Balzac. Whilst Mark Twain has solemnly averred that humor is a subject which has never had much interest for him, it is nothing more than a commonplace to say that it is as a humorist, and as a humorist only, that the world seems to persist in regarding him. The philosophy of his early life was what George Meredith has aptly termed the philosophy of the broad grin. Mr. Gilbert Chesterton once said that American humor, neither unfathomably absurd like the French, nor sharp and sensible and full of the realities of life like the Scotch, is simply the humor of imagination. It consists in piling towers on towers and mountains on mountains, of heaping a joke up to the stars and extending it to the end of the world. This partial and somewhat conventional foreign conception of American humor is admirably descriptive of the cumulative and sky-breaking humor of the early Mark Twain. Then no exaggeration was too absurd for him, no phantasm too unreal, no climax too extreme. The humor of that day was the humor bred of a barbaric freedom and a lawless, untrammeled life. Mark Twain grew up with a civilization but one remove from barbarism. Supremacy and marksmanship was the arbiter of argument. The greatest joke was the discomfiture of a fellow creature. In the laughter of these wild Westerners was something at once rustic and sanguinary. 
the refinements of art and civilization seemed effeminate artificial to these rude spirits who laughed uproariously at one another plotted dementedly in circumvention of each other's plans and gloried in their defiance of both man and god deep in their hearts they cherished tenderness for woman sympathy for the weak and the afflicted and generosity indescribable and yet they prided themselves upon their barbaric rusticity glorying in a native cunning bred of their wild life and sharpened in the struggle for existence what after all is the jumping frog but the elaborate narrative in native vernacular of a shrewd practical joke as mark twain first heard it this story was a solemn recital of an interesting incident in the life of angel's camp it was mark twain who created the story he endowed with the comic note of whimsicality that imaginative realization of une chose vue which went round the world the humor of rustic shrewdness in criticism of art so elaborately exploited in the innocents abroad was displayed perhaps invented by mark twain in the early journalistic days in san francisco in the golden era an excellent example is found in the following observations upon a celebrated painting of samson and delilah then on exhibition in san francisco now what is the first thing you see in looking at this picture down at the bank exchange is it the gleaming eye and fine face of samson or the muscular philistine gazing furtively at the lovely delilah or is it the rich drapery or is it the truth to nature in that pretty foot no sir the first thing that catches the eye is the scissors at her feet them scissors is too modern there weren't no scissors like them in them days by a damn sight that was a brilliant and audacious conception having the just proportion of sanguinary humor embodied in mark twain's offer during his lecture on the sandwich islands to show his audience how the cannibals consume their food if only some lady would lend him a live baby there is the same wildly humorous tactlessness in the delicious anecdote of higgins higgins was a simple creature who used to haul rock and on the day judge bagley fell down the courthouse steps and broke his neck higgins was commissioned to carry the body in his wagon to the house of mrs bagley and break the news to her as gently as possible when he arrived he shouted until mrs bagley came to the door and then tactfully inquired if the widder bagley lived there when she indignantly replied in the negative he gently humored her whim and inquired next if judge bagley lived there when she replied that he did higgins offered to bet that he didn't and delicately inquired if the judge were in on being assured that he was not in at present higgins triumphantly exclaimed that he expected as much because he had the old judge curled up out there in the wagon and when mrs bagley saw him she would doubtless admit that about all that could comfort the judge now would be an inquest mark twain was so fond of this bloody and ghastly humor that on one occasion he utterly overreached himself and suffered serious consequences in the words of his fellow journalist dan de quill mark twain was fond of manufacturing items of the horrible style but on one occasion he overdid this business and the disease worked its own cure he wrote an account of a terrible murder supposed to have occurred at dutch nicks a station on the carson river where empire city now stands he made a man cut his wife's throat and those of his nine children after which diabolical deed the murderer mounted his horse cut his own throat from ear to ear rode to carson city a distance of three and a half miles and fell dead in front of peter hopkins saloon all the california papers copied the item and several made editorial comment upon it as being the most shocking occurrence of the kind ever known on the pacific coast of course 
rival virginia city papers at once denounced the item as a cruel and idiotic hoax they showed how the publication of such shocking and reckless falsehoods disgraced and injured the state and they made it as sultry as possible for the enterprise and its fool reporter when the california papers saw all this and found they had been sold there was a howl from siskiyou to san diego some papers demanded the immediate discharge of the author of the item by the enterprise proprietors they said they would never quote another line from that paper while the reporter who wrote the shocking item remained on its force all this worried mark as i had never before seen him worried said he i am being burned alive on both sides of the mountains we roomed together and one night when the persecution was hottest he was so distressed that he could not sleep he tossed tumbled and groaned aloud so i set to work to comfort him mark said i never mind this bit of a gale it will soon blow itself out this item of yours will be remembered and talked about when all your other work is forgotten the murder at dutch nick's will be quoted years from now as the big sell of these times said mark i believe you are right i remember i once did a thing at home in missouri was caught at it and worried almost to death i was a mere lad and was going to school in a little town where i had an uncle living i at once left the town and did not return to it for three years when i finally came back i found i was only remembered as the boy that played the trick on the schoolmaster mark then told me the story began to laugh over it and from that moment ceased to groan he was not discharged and in less than a month people everywhere were laughing and joking about the murder at dutch nicks out of that full free western life with its tremendous hazards of fortune its extravagant alterations from fabulous wealth to wretched poverty its tremendous exaggerations and incredible contrasts was evolved a humor as rugged as mountainous and as altitudinous as the conditions which gave it birth mark twain may be said to have created and made himself master of this new and fantastic humor which in its exaggeration and elaboration was without a parallel in the history of humorous narration at times it seemed little more than a sort of infectious and hilarious nonsense but in reality it had behind it all the calculation of detail and elaboration there was something in it of the volcanic as if at the bursting forth of some pent-up force of primitive nature it consisted in piling pelion on ossa until the structure toppled over of its own weight and fell with a stentorian crash of laughter which echoed among the stars whenever mark twain conceived a humorous idea he seemed capable of extracting from it infinite complications of successive and cumulative comedy this humor seemed like the mental functionings of some mad yet inevitably logical jester it grew from more to more from extravagance to extravagance until reason itself tired and gave over such explosive stories as how i edited an agricultural paper a genuine mexican plug the deciphering of the horace greeley correspondence the facts in the case of the great beef contract and many another as mr chesterton has pointed out have one tremendous essential of great art the excitement mounts up perpetually they grow more and more comic as a tragedy should grow more and more tragic the rack tragic or comic goes round until something breaks inside a man in tragedy it is his heart or perhaps his stiff neck in farce i do not quite know what it is perhaps his funny bone is dislocated perhaps his skull is slightly cracked 
Mark Twain's mountainous humor of this early type never contains the element of final surprise, of the sudden, the unexpected, the imprévu. We know what is coming. We surrender ourselves more and more to the mood of the narrator, holding ourselves in reserve until laughter, no longer to be restrained, bursts forth in a torrent of undignified and explosive mirth. Perhaps no better example can be given than the description of the sad fate of the camel in A Tramp Abroad. In Syria, at the headwaters of the Jordan, this camel had got hold of his overcoat, and after he finished contemplating it as an article of apparel, he began to inspect it as an article of diet. In his inimitable manner, Mark describes the almost religious ecstasy of that camel as it devoured his overcoat piecemeal, first one sleeve, then the other, velvet collar, and finally the tails. All went well until the camel struck a batch of manuscript, containing some of Mark's humorous letters for the home papers. Their solid wisdom soon began to lie heavy on the camel's stomach. The jokes shook him until he began to gag and gasp, and finally he struck statements that not even a camel could swallow with impunity. He died in horrible agony, and Mark found on examination that the camel had choked to death on one of the mildest statements of fact that he had ever offered to a trusting public. Here Mark gradually works up to an anticipated climax by piling on effect after effect. Our risibility is excited almost as much by the anticipation of the climax as by the recital. Admirable instances of the ludicrous incident, of the nonsensical recital, are found in the scene in Huckleberry Finn dealing with the performance of the King's Camel Leopard or Royal Nonsuch, the address on the occasion of the dinner in honor of the seventieth anniversary of John Greenleaf Whittier, an historic failure, and the Turkish bath in The Innocents Abroad. In this prison filled with hot air, an attendant sat him down by a tank of hot water and began to polish him all over with a coarse mitten. Soon Mark noticed a disagreeable smell and realized that the more he was polished, the worse he smelt. He urged the attendant to bury him without unnecessary delay, as it was obvious that he couldn't possibly keep long in such warm weather. But the phlegmatic attendant paid no attention to Mark's commands and continued to scrub with renewed vigor. Mark's consternation changed to alarm when he discovered that little cylinders, like macaroni, began to roll from under the mitten. They were too white to be dirt. He felt that he was gradually being pared down to a convenient size. Realizing that it would take hours for the attendant to trim him down to the proper size, Mark indignantly ordered him to bring a jack plane at once and get the matter over. To all his protests, the attendant paid no attention at all. In one of the earliest critical articles about Mark Twain, which appeared in Appleton's Journal of Literature, Science and Art, for July 4, 1874, Mr. G. T. Ferris gives an excellent appreciation of his humor. Of humor in its highest phase, he says, perhaps Bret Hart may be accounted the most puissant master among our contemporary American writers. Of wit we see next to none. Mark Twain, while lacking the subtlety and pathos of the other, has more breadth, variety, and ease. His sketches of life are arabesque in their strange combinations, bits of bright, serious description, both of landscape and society, carry us along till suddenly we stumble on some master-stroke of grotesque and irresistible fun. He understands the value of repose in art. One tires of a page where every sentence sparkles with points, and the author is constantly attitudinizing for our amusement. We like to be betrayed into laughter as much in books as in real life. It is the unconscious, easy, careless gait of Mark Twain that makes his most potent charm. He seems always to be catering as much to his own enjoyment as to that of the public. He strolls along like a great rollicking schoolboy, bent on having a good time, and determined that his readers shall have it with him. 
Mark Twain is the most daring of humorists. He takes his courage in his hands for the wildest flights of fancy. His humor is the caricature of situations, rather than of individuals, and he is not afraid to risk his characters in colossally ludicrous situations. His art reveals itself in choosing ludicrous situations which contain such a strong coloring of naturalness that one's sense of reality is not outraged but titillated. Hence it is that his humor, in its earlier form, does not lend itself readily to quotation. His early humor is not epigrammatic, but cumulative and extensive. Each scene is a unit and must appear as such. Andrew Lang not inaptly catches the note of Mark Twain's earlier manner when he speaks of his almost Mephistophelian coolness, an unwearying search after the comic sides of serious subjects, after the mean possibilities of the sublime, these with a native sense of incongruities and a glorious vein of exaggeration. Mark Twain began his career as a wag, he rejoiced in being a fun-maker. He discarded the weird spellings and crude punning of his American forerunners. His object was not play upon words, but play upon ideas. He offered his public, as Frank R. Stockton pointed out, the pure ore of fun. If he puts his private mark on it, it will pass current. It does not require the mint stamp of the schools of humor. He is never afraid of being laughed at. Indeed, that is a large part of his stock and trade, for throughout his entire career nothing seemed to give him so much pleasure, though it is one of the lowest forms of humor, as making fun of himself. In describing two monkeys that got into his room at Delhi, he said that when he awoke, one of them was before the glass brushing his hair, and the other one had his notebook and was reading a page of humorous notes and crying. He didn't mind the one with the hairbrush, but the conduct of the other one cut him to the heart. He never forgave that monkey. His apostrophe, with tears, over the tomb of Adam, only to be fully appreciated in connection with his satiric indignation over the drivel of the maudlin Mr. Grimes, who never bored, but he struck water, is an admirable example of the mechanical fooling of self-ridicule. In his penetrating study, Mark Twain, a century hence, published at the time of Mr. Clemens's death, Professor H. T. Peck makes this observation. We must judge Mark Twain as a humorist by the very best of all he wrote, rather than by the more dubious productions, in which we fail to see at every moment the winning qualities and the characteristic form of this very interesting American as one would not judge of Tennyson by his dramas, nor Thackeray by his journalistic chit-chat, nor Sir Walter Scott by those romances which he wrote after his fecundity had been exhausted, so we must not judge Mark Twain by the dozen or more specimens which belong to the later period, when he was ill at ease and growing old. Let us rather go back with a sort of joy to what he wrote when he did so with spontaneity, when his fun was as natural to him as breathing, and when his humor was all American humor, not like that of Juvenal or Hierocles, acrid or devoid of anything individual, but brimming over with exactly the same rich in responsibility which belonged to Steele and Lamb and Irving. It may seem odd to group a son of the New World and of the great west with those earlier classic figures who have been mentioned here yet upon analysis it will be discovered that the humor of mark twain is at least first cousin to that which produced sir roger de coverley and rip van winkle and the stout gentleman the details of the gambetta fortu deal in which mark played a somewhat frightened second have furnished untold amusement to thousands, and his description of the inadvertent faux pas he committed at his first public lecture is humorous for any age and society. The sign announcing the lecture read, 
doors open at seven the trouble will begin at eight for three days mark had been in a state of frightful suspense once his lecture had seemed humorous but as the day approached it seemed to him to be but the dreariest of fooling without a vestige of real fun he was so panic-stricken that he persuaded three of his friends who were giants in stature genial and stormy-voiced to act as clackers and pound loudly at the faintest suspicion of a joke he bribed sawyer a half-drunk man who had a laugh hung on a hair-trigger to get off naturally and easily during the course of the evening as many laughs as he could he begged a popular citizen and his wife to take a conspicuous seat in a box so that everybody could see them he explained that when he needed help he would turn toward her and smile as a signal that he had given birth to an obscure joke then if ever was her time not to investigate but to respond the fateful night found him in the depths of dejection but heartened up by a crowded house full even to the aisles he bravely set in and proceeded to capture the house his clackers hammered madly whenever the very feeblest joke showed its head sawyer supported their herculean efforts with bursts of stentorian laughter as mark explained not without a touch of pride inferior jokes never fared so royally before but his hour of humiliation was at hand on delivering a bit of serious matter with impressive unction to which the audience listened with rapt interest he glanced involuntarily as if for her approval at his friend in the box he remembered the compact but it was too late he smiled in spite of himself forth came her ringing laugh peal after peal which touched off the whole audience the explosion was immense sawyer choked with laughter and the bludgeons performed like pile-drivers the little morsel of pathos was ruined but what matter so long as the audience took it as an intentional joke and applauded it with unparalleled enthusiasm mark wisely let it go at that reading through the innocents abroad after many years i find that it has not lost its power to provoke the most side-splitting laughter and the same may be said of a tramp abroad and following the equator which whilst not so boisterously comical exhibit greater mastery and restraint his own luck as mark twain observed on one occasion had been curious all his literary life he never could tell a lie that anybody would doubt nor a truth that anybody would believe could there be a more accurate or more concise definition of the effect of his writings in especial of his travel notes like his mother he too never used large words but he had a natural gift for making small ones do effective work how delightfully human is his comment on the vagaries of woman's shopping human nature he found very much the same all over the world and he felt that it was so much like his dear native home to see a venetian lady go into a store buy ten cents worth of blue ribbon and then have it sent home in a scowl it was such little touches of nature as this which as he said moved him to tears in those far-off lands in speaking of palestine he says that its holy places are not as deliriously beautiful as the books paint them indeed he asserts that if one be calm and resolute he can look on their beauty and live he bequeathed his rheumatism to baden baden it was little but it was all he had to give his only regret was that he could not leave something more catching there is nothing better in all of the innocents abroad than his analysis of the theological hierarchy of the roman catholic church disclaiming all intention to be frivolous irreverent or blasphemous he solemnly declared that his observations had taught him the real way the holy personages were ranked in rome the mother of god otherwise the virgin mary comes first followed in order by the deity peter and some twelve or fifteen canonized popes and martyrs last of all came jesus christ the saviour but even then always as an infant in arms 
who can ever forget the mark twain who kissed the hawaiian stranger for his mother's sake the while robbing him of his small change who was so struck by the fine points of his honolulan horse that he hung his hat on one of them who rode glaciers as gaily as he rode mexican plugs and found diverting programs of the roman coliseum in the dust and rubbish of two thousand years ago samuel l clemens achieved instantaneous and world-wide popularity at a single bound by the creation of a fantastic and delightfully naive character known as mark twain at a somewhat later day bernard shaw achieved world-wide fame by the creation of a legendary and fantastic wit known as g b s to the composition of mark twain went all the wild humor of ignorance the boisterously comic admixture of the sanguinary and the stoical the humor of the jumping frog and the innocence abroad is the savage and naive humor of the mining camp not the sophisticated humor of civilization it is significant that mademoiselle blanc a polished and refined intelligence found the nil admirari attitude of mark twain no more enlightening nor suggestive than the stoicism of the north american indian this mirthful and mock innocent naivete so alien to the delicate and subtle spirit of the french found instant response in the heart of the anglo-saxon and germanic peoples the english and the germans no less than the americans rejoiced in this gay fellow with his combination of appealing ignorance and but half concealed shrewdness they laughed at this unsophistic naif gazing in wide-eyed wonderment at all he saw and they delighted in the consciousness that behind this thin mask lay an acute and searching intelligence reveling in the humorous havoc wrought by his keen perception of the contrasts and incongruities of life the note of this early humor is perfectly caught in the incident of the egyptian mummy deliberately assumed ignorance of the grossest sort by mark twain and his companions had the most devastating effect upon the foreign guide one of that countless tribe to all of whom mark applied the generic name of ferguson after driving ferguson nearly mad with pretended ignorance they finally asked him if the mummy was dead when ferguson glibly replied that he had been dead three thousand years he was dumbfounded at the fury of the doctor for being imposed upon with vile second-hand carcasses the poor frenchman was warned that if he didn't bring out a nice fresh corpse at once they would brain him no wonder that later when he was asked for a description of the party ferguson laconically remarked that they were lunatics in speaking of contemporary society ibsen once remarked we have made a fiasco both in the heroic and the lover roles the only parts in which we have shown a little talent are the naively comic but with our more highly developed self-consciousness we shall no longer be fitted even for that with time and our highly developed self-consciousness have largely passed the novelty and the charm of this early naively comic humor of mark twain but it is as valid still as it was in eighteen sixty seven to record honestly the impressions directly communicated to one by the novelties peculiarities individual standards and ideals of other peoples and races mark twain spoke his mind with utter disregard for other people's opinions the dicta of criticism or the authoritative judgment of the schools the innocence abroad is eminently readable not alone for its humor its clever journalism its remarkably accurate and detailed information and its fine descriptions the rare quality which made it sell right along like the bible is that it is the vital record of a keen and searching intelligence mark twain found so many of the masterpieces of the world utterly unimpressive and meaningless to him that he actually began to distrust the validity of his own impressions 
every time he gloried to think that for once he had discovered an ancient painting that was beautiful and worthy of all praise the pleasure it gave him was an infallible proof that it was not a beautiful picture nor in any sense worthy of commendation he pours out the torrents of his ridicule not indiscriminately upon the works of the old masters themselves though he regarded nature as the grandest of all the old masters but upon those half-baked sycophants who bend the knee to an art they do not understand an art of which they feign comprehension by mouthings full of cheap and meaningless tags as potent and effective as ever in its fine comic irony is that passage in which he expresses his envy of those people who pay lavish lip-service to scenes and works of art which their expressionless language shows they never realize nor understand he reserves his most biting condemnation for those second-hand critics who accept other people's opinions for their criteria and rave over beauty soul character expression and tone in wretched dingy moth-eaten pictures he hated with the heartiest detestation such people whose sole ambition seemed to be to make a fine show of knowledge of art by means of an easily acquired vocabulary of inexpressive technical terms of art criticism there is much i fear of misguided honesty in mark twain's records of foreign travel to the things which he personally reverenced he was always reverential and his expression of likes and dislikes of prejudices and predilections was honest and fearless grant as we may the humorist's right to exaggerate and even to distort for the purposes of his fun-making it does not therefore follow that his judgments however forthright or sincere are valid reputable criticisms one's enjoyment of his fresh and hilarious humor his persistent fun-making is no whit impaired by the recognition that he was lacking in the faculty of historic imagination and in the finer artistic sense it is in a measure because of his lack of culture and more broadly lack of real knowledge that he was enabled to evoke the laughter of the multitude the mississippi pilot homely naive arrogantly candid says mr s p sherman refuses to sink his identity in the object contemplated that as corporal nim would have said is the humor of it he is the kind of traveling companion that makes you wonder why you went abroad he turns the old world into a laughing-stock by shearing it of its storied humanity simply because there is nothing in him to respond to the glory that was greece to the grandeur that was rome simpler because nothing is holier to him than a joke he does not throw the comic light upon counterfeit enthusiasm he laughs at art history and antiquity from the point of view of one who is ignorant of them and mightily well satisfied with his ignorance this picture reminds us of the foreign critics of the innocents abroad and a connecticut yankee in king arthur's court it is too partial and restricted the whole point of mark twain's humor as exhibited in these travel notes is missed in the statement that he does not throw the comic light upon counterfeit enthusiasm for this might almost be taken as the philosophy of his books of foreign travel and yet mr sherman's dictum in its entirety quite clearly provokes the question whether as he intimates the overwhelming majority of his fellow-citizens also were not mightily pleased with mark twain's point of view and whether they did not enjoy themselves hugely in laughing not at him but with him in commenting on the reasons for the broadening and deepening of his humor with the passage of time mr clemens once remarked to me i succeeded in the long run where shillaber doe sticks and billings failed because they never had an ideal higher than that of merely being funny the first great lesson of my life was the discovery that i had to live down my past 
when I first began to lecture, and in my earlier writings my sole idea was to make comic capital out of everything I saw and heard. My object was not to tell the truth, but to make people laugh. I treated my readers as unfairly as I treated everybody else, eager to betray them at the end with some monstrous absurdity or some extravagant anticlimax. One night, after a lecture in the early days, Tom Fitch, the silver-tongued orator of Nevada, said to me, Clemens, your lecture was magnificent. It was eloquent, moving, sincere. Never in my entire life have I listened to such a magnificent piece of descriptive narration. But you committed one unpardonable sin, the unpardonable sin. It is a sin you must never commit again. You closed a most eloquent description by which you had keyed your audience up to a pitch of intensest interest with a piece of atrocious anticlimax which nullified all the really fine effect you had produced. My dear Clemens, whatever you do, never sell your audience. And that, continued Mr. Clemens, was my first really profitable lesson. It was the toning down of his youthful extravagance, Fitch's precept not to sell his audience, Mrs. Fairbank's warning not to try their endurance of the irreverent too far, that had a markedly salutary effect upon Mark Twain's humorous writings. There can be no doubt that the deep and lifelong friendship of Mr. Howells, expressing itself as occasion demanded in the friendliest criticism, had a subduing influence upon Mark Twain's tendency, as a humorist, to extravagance and headlong exaggeration. In time he left the field of carpet-bag observation, the humorous depicting of things seen from the rear of an observation car, so to speak, and turned to fiction. Now, at last, the long pent-up flood of observation upon human character and human characteristics found full vent. Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn are the romances of eternal youth, the same yesterday, today, and forever. They are freighted, however, with a wealth of pungent and humorous characterizations that have made them contemporary classics. From ethical sophistication and moral truantry, Mark Twain evolves an inexhaustible supply of humor. The revolt of mischievous and bohemian boyhood against the stern limitations of formal Puritanism is, in a sense, a principle that he carried with him to the grave. There are no more vital passages in his fiction, says Mr. Howells, than those which embody character as it is affected for good as well as for evil by the severity of the local Sunday schooling and church going. Out of the pangs of conscience, the ingenious sedatives of sophistry, the numerous variations of the lie, he won a wholesome humor that left you thinking, by inversion, upon the moral involved. Knowledge of human nature finds expression in forms made permanently effective through the arresting permeation of humor. The incident of Tom Sawyer and the whitewashing of the fence, 
is the sort of thing over which boy and man alike can chuckle with satisfaction for tom sawyer had discovered a great law of human action without knowing it namely that in order to make a man or boy covet a thing it is only necessary to make the thing difficult to attain huck's reasoning about chicken stealing the exquisitely comic shifting of ground from morality to expediency is a striking example of the best type of mark twain humor following his father's example huck would occasionally lift a chicken that wasn't roosting comfortable for had his father not told him that even if he didn't want the chicken himself he could always find somebody that did want it and a good deed ain't never forgot huck confesses that he had never seen his pap when he didn't want the chicken himself the germ of mark twain's humor wherever it is found from the innocents abroad to the connecticut yankee and captain stormfield's visit to heaven is found in the mental reactions resulting from stupendous and glaring contrasts first it is the wild western humorist primitive and untamed running amuck through the petrified formulas and encrusted traditions of europe then comes the fantastic juxtaposition of the shrewd connecticut yankee with his comic irreverence and raucous sense of humor his bourgeois limitations and provincial prejudices to the court of king arthur with its medievalism its primitive rudeness and social narrowness how many have delighted in the yankee's inimitable description of his feelings toward that classic damsel of the sixth century at first he got along easily with the girl but after a while he began to feel for her a sort of mysterious and shuddery reverence whenever she began to unwind one of those long sentences of hers and got it well under way he could never suppress the feeling that he was standing in the awful presence of the mother of the german language mark twain ransacked the whole world of his own day all countries savage and civilized for the display of effective and ludicrous contrast and he opened up an illimitable field for humanizing satire as mr howells has said in his juxtaposition of sociologic types thirteen centuries apart not even heaven was safe from the comprehensive survey of his satire and captain stormfield's visit to heaven is a remarkable document a forthright lay sermon the conventional idea of heaven the theologic conception of eternity as heedlessly taught from the pulpit thrown into comic yet profoundly significant relief against the background of the common sense of a deeply human thoroughly modern intelligence humor as thackeray has defined it is a combination of wit and love certain it is that in the case of mark twain wit was a later development of his humor the love was there all the time mark twain has not been recognized as a wit for he was primarily a humorist and only secondarily a wit but the passion for brief and pungent formulation of an idea grew upon him and puddenhead wilson's calendar is a mine of homely and memorable aphorism epigram injunction end of part one of the humorist read by john greenman this is section five of mark twain by archibald henderson this librivox recording is in the public domain the humorist part two read by john greenman according to mark twain's classification the comic story is english the witty story french the humorous story american while the other two depend upon matter the humorous story depends for its effect upon the manner of telling the witty story and the comic story must be concise and end with a point but the humorous story may be as leisurely as you please and have no particular destination mark twain always maintained that while any one could tell effectively a comic or witty story it required a person skilled in an art of rare and distinctive character 
to tell a humorous story successfully. Mark Twain was himself the supreme exemplar of the art of telling a humorous story. Take this little passage, for example, which convulsed one of his London audiences. He was speaking of a high mountain that he had come across in his travels. It is so cold that people who have been there find it impossible to speak the truth. I know that's a fact. Here a pause, a blank stare, a shake of the head, a little stroll across the platform, a sigh, a puff, a smothered groan. <clears throat> because I've, another pause, been, a longer pause, there myself. Who could equal Mark Twain as a humorous narrator in his recital of the alarums and excursions, criminations and recriminations over the story of someone else's dog he sold to General Miles for three dollars? He delighted numerous audiences with his story of inveighing Mrs. Grover Cleveland at a White House reception into writing blindly on the back of a card he didn't. When she turned it over, she discovered that it bore on the other side, in Mrs. Clemens' handwriting, the startling words, Don't wear your arctics in the White House. I shall never forget his recital of the story of how his enthusiasm oozed away at a meeting in behalf of foreign missions. So moving was the fervid eloquence of the exhorter that, after fifteen minutes, if Mark Twain had had a blank check with him, he would gladly have turned it over, signed to the minister, to fill out for any amount. But it was a very warm evening. The eloquence of the minister was inexhaustible, and Mark Twain's enthusiasm for foreign missions slowly oozed away one hundred dollars, fifty dollars, and even lower still, so that when the plate was actually passed around, Mark put in ten cents and took out a quarter. I was a witness in London and at Oxford in 1907 of the vast, spontaneous, national reception which Mark Twain received from the English people. One incident of that memorable visit is a perfect example of that masterly power over an audience, that deep humanity with which Mark Twain was endowed. At the banquet presided over by the Lord Mayor of Liverpool, which was the signal of Mark Twain's farewell to the English people, his peroration was as follows many and many a year ago i read an anecdote in dana's two years before the mast a frivolous little self-important captain of a coasting sloop in the dried apple and kitchen furniture trade was always hailing every vessel that came in sight just to hear himself talk and air his small grandeurs. One day a majestic Indiaman came plowing by with course on course of canvas towering into the sky, her decks and yards swarming with sailors with macaws and monkeys and all manner of strange and romantic creatures populating her rigging, and there too her freightage of precious spices lading the breeze with gracious and mysterious odors of the Orient. Of course the little coaster captain hopped into the shrouds and squeaked a hail ship ahoy what ship is that and whence and whither in a deep and thunderous bass came the answer back through a speaking trumpet 
the begum of bengal a hundred and twenty-three days out from canton homeward bound what ship is that the little captain's vanity was all crushed out of him and most humbly he squeaked back only the mary ann fourteen hours from boston bound for kittery point with with nothing to speak of that eloquent word only expressed the deeps of his stricken humbleness and what is my case during perhaps one hour in the twenty-four not more than that i stop and reflect then i am humble then i am properly meek and for that little time i am only the marie anne fourteen hours out and cargoed with vegetables and tinware but all the other twenty-three my self-satisfaction rides high and i am the stately indiaman ploughing the great seas under a cloud of sail and laden with a rich freightage of the kindest words that were ever spoken to a wandering alien i think my twenty-six crowded and fortunate days multiplied by five and i am the begum of bengal a hundred and twenty-three days out from canton homeward bound says charles vale in describing the scene the audience sat spellbound in almost painful silence till it could restrain itself no longer and when in rich resonant uplifted voice mark twain sang out the words i am the begum of bengal a hundred and twenty-three days out from canton there burst forth a great cheer from one end of the room to the other it seemed an inopportune cheer and for a moment it upset the orator yet it was felicitous in opportuneness slowly after a long pause came the last two words like that curious detached and high note in which a great piece of music suddenly ends homeward bound again there was a cheer but this time it was lower it was subdued it was the fitting echo to the beautiful words with their double significance the parting from a hospitable land the return to the native land only a great literateur could have conceived such a passage only a great orator could have so delivered it mark twain was the greatest master of the anecdote this generation has known he claimed the humorous story as an american invention and one that has remained at home his public speeches were little mosaics in the finesse of their art and the intricacies of inflection insinuation jovial innuendo which mark twain threw into his gestures his implicative pauses his suggestive shrugs and deprecative nods all these are hopelessly volatized and disappear entirely from the printed copy of his speeches he gave the most minute and elaborate study to the preparation of his speeches polishing them dexterously and rehearsing every word every gesture with infinite care yet his readiness and fertility of resource in taking advantage and making telling use of things in the speeches of those immediately preceding him were striking evidences of the rapidity of his thought processes in boston when asked 
what he thought about the existence of a heaven or a hell, he looked grave for a moment, and then replied, I don't want to express an opinion. It's policy for me to keep silent. You see, I have friends in both places. His speech introducing General Hawley of Connecticut to a Republican meeting at Elmira, New York, is an admirable example of his laconic art. General Hawley is a member of my church at Hartford, and the author of Beautiful Snow. Maybe he will deny that, but I am only here to give him a character from his last place. As a pure citizen I respect him. As a personal friend of years I have the warmest regard for him. As a neighbor whose vegetable garden adjoins mine, why, why, I watch him. As the author of beautiful snow, he has added a new pang to winter. He is a square, true man in honest politics, and I must say he occupies a mighty lonesome position. So broad, so bountiful is his character that he never turned a tramp empty-handed from his door, but always gave him a letter of introduction to me. Pure, honest, incorruptible, that is Joe Hawley. Such a man in politics is like a bottle of perfumery in a glue factory. It may modify the stench, but it doesn't destroy it. I haven't said any more of him than I would say of myself. Ladies and gentlemen, this is General Hawley. Mr. Chesterton maintains that Mark Twain was a wit rather than a humorist, perhaps something more than a humorist. Wit, he explains, requires an intellectual athleticism because it is akin to logic. A wit must have something of the same running, working, and staying power as a mathematician or a metaphysician. Moreover, wit is a fighting thing and a working thing. A man may enjoy humor all by himself. He may see a joke when no one else sees it. He may see the point and avoid it. But wit is a sword. It is meant to make people feel the point as well as see it. All honest people saw the point of Mark Twain's wit. Not a few dishonest people felt it. The epigram, Be virtuous and you will be eccentric, has become a catchword, and everyone has heard Mark Twain's reply to the reporter asking for advice as to what to cable his paper, which had printed the statement that Mark Twain was dead, Say that the statement is greatly exaggerated. He has admirably taken off humanity's enduring self-conceit in the statement that there isn't a parallel of latitude, but thinks it would have been the equator if it had had its rights. There is something peculiarly American in his warning to young girls not to marry, that is, not to excess. His remarks on compliments have a delightful and naive freshness. He points out how embarrassing compliments always are. It is so difficult to take them naturally. You never know what to say. He had received many compliments in his lifetime, and they had always embarrassed him. He always felt that they hadn't said enough. The incident of Mark Twain's first meeting with Whistler is quaintly illustrative of one phase of his broader humor. Mark Twain was taken by a friend to Whistler's studio, 
just as he was putting the finishing touches to one of his fantastic studies. Confident of the usual commendation, Whistler inquired his guest's opinion of the picture. Mark Twain assumed the air of a connoisseur, and approaching the picture, remarked that it did very well, but he didn't care much for that cloud, and suiting the action to the word, appeared to be on the point of rubbing the cloud with his gloved finger. In genuine horror, Whistler exclaimed, Don't touch it! The paint's wet! Oh, that's all right, replied Mark with his characteristic drawl. These aren't my best gloves, anyhow. Whereat Whistler recognized a congenial spirit, and their first hearty laugh together was the beginning of a friendly and congenial relationship. I recall an incident in connection with the writing of his autobiography. On more than one occasion he declared that the autobiography was going to be something awful, as caustic, fiendish, and devilish as he could make it. Actually he was in the habit of jotting on the margin of the page, opposite to some startling characterization or diabolic joke, not to be published until ten, or twenty, or thirty years after my death. One day I heard him vent his pent-up rage in bitter and caustic words upon a certain strenuous, limelight American politician. I could not resist the temptation to ask him if this, too, were going into the autobiography. Oh, yes, he replied, decisively. Everything goes in. I make no exceptions. But he added reflectively, with the suspicion of a twinkle in his eye, I shall make a note beside this passage, not to be published until one hundred and fifty years after my death. Mark Twain had numerous doubles scattered about the world. The number continually increased. Once a month, on an average, he would receive a letter from a new double, enclosing a photograph in proof of the resemblance. Mark once wrote to one of these doubles as follows. My dear sir, many thanks for your letter with enclosed photograph. Your resemblance to me is remarkable. In fact, to be perfectly honest, you look more like me than I look like myself. I was so much impressed by the resemblance that I have had your picture framed and am now using it regularly in place of a mirror to shave by. Yours gratefully, S. L. Clemens. Although not generally recognized, it is undoubtedly true that Mark Twain was a wit as well as a humorist. He was the author of many epigrams and curt aphorisms which have become stock phrases in conversation, quoted in all classes of society, wherever the English language is spoken. His phrasing is unpretentious, even homely, wearing none of the polished brilliancy of La Rochefoucauld or Bernard Shaw. But Mark Twain's sayings stick because they are rooted in shrewdness and hard common sense. Mark Twain's warning to the two burglars who stole his silverware from Stormfield and were afterwards caught and sent to the penitentiary is very amusing, though not highly complimentary to American political life. Now you two young men have been up to my house stealing my tinware and got pulled in by these Yankees up here. You had much better have stayed in New York, where you have the pull. Don't you see where you're drifting? They'll send you from here down to Bridgeport Jail, and the next thing you know you'll be in the United States Senate. There's 
no other future left open to you the sign he posted after the visitation of these same burglars was a prominent ornament of the billiard-room at stormfield notice to the next burglar there is nothing but plated ware in this house now and henceforth you will find it in that brass thing in the dining-room over in the corner by the basket of kittens if you want the basket put the kittens in the brass thing do not make a noise it disturbs the family you will find rubbers in the front hall by that thing which has the umbrellas in it chiffonier i think they call it or pergola or something like that please close the door when you go away very truly yours s l clemens now these are examples of mark twain's humor american humor such as we are accustomed to expect from mark twain humor not unmixed with a strong spice of wit but mark twain was capable of wit pure and unadulterated curt and concise i once saw him write in a young girl's birthday book an aphorism which he said was one of his favorites truth is our most valuable possession let us economize it the advice he once gave me as to the proper frame of mind for undergoing a surgical operation has always remained in my memory console yourself with the reflection that you are giving the doctor pleasure and that he is getting paid for it peculiarly memorable in his forthright dictum that the statue which advertises its modesty with a fig-leaf brings its modesty under suspicion his business motto unfortunately a motto that he never followed has often been attributed because of its canny shrewdness to mr andrew carnegie the idea was to put all your eggs in one basket and then watch that basket his anti-puritanical convictions find concrete expression in his assertion that few things are harder to put up with than the annoyance of a good example truly classic in usage if not in form is his happy saying that faith is believing what you know ain't so his definition of a classic as a book which people praise but don't read is as frequently heard as are biblical and shakespearean tags mr clemens once told me that he had composed between two and three hundred maxims during his life many of them especially those from the old and new calendars of pudd'nhead wilson bear the individual and peculiar stamp of mark twain's phraseology and outlook upon life quaint genial and shrewd in pursuance of his deep-rooted belief in the omnipotent power of training he remarked that the peach was once a bitter almond the cauliflower nothing but cabbage with a college education he himself was not guiltless of that irreverence which he defined as disrespect for another man's god women took an almost unholy delight in describing some of their undesirable acquaintances in mark twain's phrase as neither quite refined nor quite unrefined but just the kind of person that keeps a parrot at times mark twain realized the sanctifying power of illusions in a world of harsh realities for he asserted that when illusions are gone you may still exist but you have ceased to live a depressing sense of world weariness sometimes overbore the native joyousness of his temperament and he expressed his sense of deep gratitude to adam the first great benefactor of the race because he had brought death into the world a funeral always gave mark twain a sense of spiritual uplift a sense of thankfulness because the dead friend had been set free he thought it was far harder to live than to die in one of his early sketches there was admirable wit in the suggestion to the organist for a hymn appropriate to a sermon on the prodigal son oh we'll all get blind drunk when johnny comes marching home and in the innocents abroad 
there is the same sort of brilliant wit in the mad logic of his innocent query on learning that st philip neri's heart was so inflamed with divine love that it burst his ribs i was curious to know what philip had for dinner mark twain was capable of epigrams worthy in their dark levity of swift himself in speaking of pudd'nhead wilson anna e keeling has said humor there is in almost every scene and every page but it is such humor as sheds a wild gleam on the greatest shakespearean tragedies on the deep melancholy of hamlet the heartbreak of lear the greatest ironic achievements of mark twain in brief compass are the two stories the man that corrupted hadleyburg and was it heaven or hell they reveal the power and subtlety of his art as an ironic humorist or shall we rather say ironic wit for they range all the way from the most mordant to the most pathetic irony from mephistophelian laughter to warm human tears sunt lacrimae rerum make a reputation first by your more solid achievements counseled oliver wendell holmes you can't expect to do anything great with macbeth if you first come on flourishing paul pry's umbrella mark twain has had to pay in full the penalty of comic greatness the world is loath to accept a popular character at any rating other than its own whosoever sets himself the task of amusing the world must realize the almost insuperable difficulty of inducing the world to regard him as a serious thinker says Molier, c'est une étrange entreprise que celle de faire rire les honnêtes de gens the strangeness of the undertaking is no less pronounced than the rigor of its obligations mark twain began his career as a professional humorist and fun-maker he frankly donned the motley the cap and bells the man in the street is not easily persuaded that the basis of the comic is not uncommon nonsense but glorified common sense the french have a fine flavored distinction in ce qui remue from ce qui émeut and if remuage is the defining characteristic of a tramp abroad roughing it and the innocents abroad there is much of deep seriousness and genuine emotion in life on the mississippi tom sawyer huckleberry finn and pudd'nhead wilson in the course of his lifetime mark twain evolved from a fun-maker into a masterly humorist from a sensational journalist into a literary artist in explanation of this let us recall the steps in that revolution in his youth this boy had no schooling worth speaking of he lived in an environment that promised only stagnation and decay as the young boy barefooted and dirty watched the steamboats pass and repass upon the surface of that great inland deep the mississippi he conceived the ambition and the ideal of learning to know and to master that mysterious water his dream in time was realized he not only became a pilot but which is infinitely more significant he changed from a callow indolent unobservant lad with undeveloped faculties to a man a master of the river with a knowledge which in its accuracy and minuteness was for its purpose all-sufficient and complete i have always felt that had it not been for this training in the great university of the mississippi mark twain might never have acquired that trained faculty for minute detail and descriptive elaboration without which his works full of flaws as they are might never have revealed the very real art which they betray for the art of mark twain is the art of taking infinite pains the art of exactitude precision and detail humor per se is as ephemeral as the laugh dying in the very moment of its birth art alone can give it enduring vitality mark twain's native temperament rich with humor and racy of the soil 
drank in the wonder of the river and unfolded through communication with all its rude human devotees the quick mind the eager susceptibility developed and matured through rigorous education in particularity and detail and before his spirit the very beauties of nature herself disappeared in face of a consuming sense of the work of the world that must be done mark twain never wholly escaped the penalty that his reputation as a humorist compelled him to pay he became more than popular novelist more than a jovial entertainer he became a public institution as unmistakable and as national as the library of congress or the democratic party even in the latest years of his life though long since dissociated in fact from the category of artemus ward john phoenix josh billings and petroleum v nasby mark twain could never be sure that his most solemn utterance might not be drowned in roars of thoughtless laughter it has been a very serious and a very difficult matter mr clemens once said to me to doff the mask of humor with which the public is accustomed in thought to see me adorned it is the incorrigible practice of the public in this or in any country to see only humor in the humorist however serious his vein not long ago i wrote a poem which i never dreamed of giving to the, the public on account of its seriousness but on being invited to address the women students at a certain great university i was persuaded by a near friend to read this poem at the close of my lecture i said now ladies i am going to read you a poem of mine which was greeted with bursts of uproarious laughter but this is a truly serious poem i asseverated only to be greeted with renewed and this time more uproarious laughter nettled by this misunderstanding i put the poem in my pocket saying well young ladies since you do not believe me to be serious i shall not read the poem at which the audience almost went into convulsions of laughter humor is a function of nationality the same joke as related by an american a scotchman an irishman a frenchman carries with it a distinctive racial flavor and individuality of approach indeed it is open to question whether most humor is not essentially local in its nature requiring some specialized knowledge of some particular locality it would be quite impossible for an italian on his native heath to understand that great political satirist mr dooley on the negro problem for example after reading george Ade's fables in slang mr andrew lang was driven to the desperate conclusion that humor varies with the parallels of latitude a joke in chicago being a riddle in london if one would lay his finger upon the secret of mark twain's world-wide popularity as a humorist he would find that secret primarily in the universality and humanity of his humor mark twain is a master in the art of broad contrast incongruity lurks on the surface of his humor and there is about it a staggering and cyclopean surprise but these are mere surface qualities more or less common though at lower power 
to all forms of humor. Nor is his international vogue as a humorist to be attributed to any tricks of style, to any breadth of knowledge, or even to any depth of intellectuality. His hold upon the world is due to qualities not of the head, but of the heart. I once heard Mr. Clemens say that humor is the key to the hearts of men, for it springs from the heart. And worthy of record is his dictum that there is far more of feeling than of thought in genuine humor. Mark Twain succeeded in tickling the midriff of the English-speaking races with a single story, and in time he showed himself to be not only a man of letters, but also a man of action. His humor has been defined as the sunny break of his serious purpose. Horace Walpole has said that the world is a comedy to the man of thought, a tragedy to the man of feeling. To the great humorist, to Mark Twain, the world was a tragic comedy. Like Smile Faggot, he seemed at times to feel that grief is the most real and important thing in the world, because it separates us from happiness. He was an exemplar of the highest, truest, sincerest humor, perfectly fulfilling George Meredith's definition, If you laugh all round him, tumble him, roll him about, deal him a smack, and drop a tear on him, own his likeness to you and yours to your neighbor, spare him as little as you shun, pity him as much as you expose, it is the spirit of humor that is moving you. Mark Twain's fun was light-hearted and insouciant, his pathos genuine and profound. He is above all, said that oldest of English journals, the spectator, the fearless upholder of all that is clean, noble, straightforward, innocent, and manly. If he is a jester, he jests with the mirth of the happiest of the Puritans. He has read much of English knighthood, and translated the best of it into his living pages, and he has assuredly already won a high degree in letters, in having added more than any writer since Dickens to the gaiety of the empire of the English language. Mark Twain's humor flowed warm from the heart. He enjoyed to the utmost those two inalienable blessings, laughter and the love of friends. He woke the laughter of an epoch, and numbered a world for his friends. He is the true consolidator of nations, said Mr. Augustine Burrell. His delightful humor is of the kind which dissipates and destroys national prejudices. His truth and his honor, his love of truth and his love of honor, overflow all boundaries. He has made the world better by his presence. End of The Humorist, Part 2, read by John Greenman.